Welcome back to uh, part three of Normal Isn't Working. Uh, Trey did a great job last week, so that was exciting. Um, so he did, a, he did a great job. Thank you, Larry. Give it up for Larry. Larry's an MVP. Uh, yeah, Larry's extraordinary. Um, first week, I started talking about how um, I pranked uh, my little brother, Colby and Jeremiah, at... Uh, at Oak Bridge City, it was one of the greatest moments of my life. It really was, um, and and I was thinking, like you know, part of me just kind of enjoys giving people trouble a little bit. Uh, it's in our genetics, I think, actually, as 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 noblets, and so I kind of enjoy giving people trouble and having a good time. And I was thinking, like, do you know how you could maybe freak someone out, even tonight? Like maybe you maybe the way that you could you know, kind of make people be like, whoa, what's he talking about? That kind of scares me a little bit. Is just end a normal conversation with a warning, okay? Just like a normal conversation with a really random warning or like ca cautionary tone where you just say something kind of out of the blue. Like let's say you're texting one of your friends tonight. You're like, hey, good night, you know, see you tomorrow. And you're just like, don't close your eyes tonight. And just leave it at that. Leave it at that. Like, ju just leave it hanging. You know, like, maybe one of your friends says, like, can't wait to see you tomorrow at school, and then just be like, yep, watch your back. Just leave it there. See what happens. I think that would be kind of scary. And the reason I share that is because that's what this guy named John does in his letter to a bunch of Christians. In fact, a bunch of people that he really loves. And this John guy is one of Jesus' best friends, okay? When Jesus walked the earth, he had been walking with Jesus for a long time. And we're led to believe that when John writes the words that we're about to read, he's, he's at a really old age. And I don't know, how many of you guys have grandparents? You guys have grandparents, okay? I, I, my grandpa actually just passed away um, within the last year. And I remember even when I was young, okay, like when he got serious, he would always tell those grandpa jokes that I never understood, but because I loved him, I had to act like I knew what he was talking about, and so I'd like have to chuckle. But when he got serious and said something real, I remember from a young age, I remember just thinking, wow, he's so wise. Like, I got to take that seriously. Like, that's my grandpa. Like, that, like you know, and, and maybe you feel the same way. Scripture actually talks about that. It talks about how gray hair is like, you know, it's like this crown of wisdom and it talks about it in the Proverbs. And so really, John is at the end of his life, okay, and he gives this letter about the love of God. It's kind of this comprehensive document about the love of God and our response to that, how we should love others. We actually just sang about it, really, in Build My Life. And then he ends with this, okay, if you read the letter, it not, it's not necessarily random if you kind of understand what he's saying, but kind of like at first glance, you're like, couldn't you have just said goodbye? Like, couldn't you have like done like Paul did and give a couple shout outs? Just be like, grace and peace, love you, you know? But no, he says this in 1 John 5, 21. Dear children, keep yourself from idols. Keep yourselves from idols. And if you had read this, you'd been like, okay, like John said it, this is really important. And I guess like my question that I have for us tonight is, is, is why would he say that? Like he would say that to us. Like why would he end that way? And, and idols are really just false gods. We're going to talk about them tonight. Why would he give that caution? What, why would he say that? I mean, right? Like if you believe that Jesus is who he says he is, that he died, that he rose again, like wouldn't you, wouldn't it just kind of be natural to like worship him and him only? Like not let something else take the place of God in our lives. But I think John knows something about you and John knows something about me. And it's the reality that you are a worshiper. You, you're a worshiper. I think we have that. We can throw it up on the screen. And, and what that means is, is, is John knows that while Jesus, and why we have the throne up here, is Jesus is king. He's seated in the heavens, okay? After he died and rose again, he was ascended up into heaven. He sits at the right hand of the Father. He is Lord. But while a lot of times he is like, you know, seated on a throne in heaven as a student, as a leader, as a parent, he's not necessarily seated on the throne of our hearts. And so John says, keep yourselves from idols. And he, and he, and he knows this. He says this is important because you're, you're a worshiper. By design, stick with me here, by design, you have been literally created by God to hold something or someone in highest esteem or highest value, to devote your whole life to something, 
to give your attention and affections to someone or something greater than yourself. And I believe because Jesus created you, seventh grader or 12th grader or leader or everyone in between, I believe you've been created to worship Jesus. I believe that you've been created to not wait until you get to heaven to kneel before your Savior, but I believe this should be the posture of your life. Another way we could say it for the sake of the illustration is you've been created to literally revolve your whole world around Jesus, around his kingship and his lordship. I believe your schoolwork, your friendship, your dating, hello, your singleness, your athletics, your clubs, whatever you partake in, your band, all of these different things should revolve around your Savior, Jesus. And so John says, hey, keep yourself from idols. A better translation of this would be guard yourself from idols. Guard this seat. You're a worshiper. And because you're designed to worship someone or something greater than yourselves, if Jesus, if you're not, if, if you don't revolve your world around Jesus, you're going to revolve your world around something else. If Jesus isn't seated on the throne of your heart or your life, something or someone else will be. Guard yourself from idols. That's what we're going to talk about for like 15 or 20 minutes. And some of you are like idols. You know, if you think of that verse in the Bible or something, you think of like a wooden sculpture, you know? Like, I'm not going to give myself to something like that. I'm not going to bow down to a sculpture or some random Greek god that they're talking about in the New Testament. But even if you looked at like the first century when people would bow down to idols, it wouldn't be because they really in, like really thought, wow, this, uh, this Greek God is a really cool name, you know, like Aphrodite. I'm going to give my life to you because your name is awesome. No, who they would bow down to had to do with their affections. If they valued money over anything, they would worship Artemis. If they valued power or prestige, they would worship Ares. And we could go on and on and on and on. And when we think of it this way, we need to understand, and John understands, that's why he ends this whole letter with this, is that if that's the case, anything or anyone can become an idol. Tim Keller says it this way, anything in your life that is so central that you can't have a meaningful life if you lose it is an idol. Anything apart from Jesus, okay, in your world, where if it was gone, your world would come crashing down. Your meaning, your purpose, it's gone. Maybe, just maybe, it's an idol. Martin Lloyd-Jones says it this way. An idol is anything to which I give much of my time, attention, energy, or money to the point where it holds a controlling position in your life. And so if we're talking about an idol or a false god or something, you know, that you hold higher in esteem than you do Jesus, maybe the question that we need to ask is who or what has your attention and affections? Who or what more than anything has your attention and affections? Where do all your thoughts go? Where does your heart go more than anywhere else? Maybe, just maybe, that's an idol. And so you guys want to talk about a couple, maybe, that sneak into our lives as students? A couple of you do? Okay, cool. Awesome. A couple of you are with me. First one's this. You guys might think this is real random, but for middle schoolers and high school, maybe something that sits on the throne, sneaks into your life, and takes the place of God in your world is work. Work. Some of you are like, what you talking about, right? Like work, I don't work, you know, like I don't even know if I like it, you know? And I think a lot of times, I've never said this by the way, but millennials and Generation Z, like you, you know, you guys get labeled at times as like, correct me if I'm wrong, but sometimes like the generation that just doesn't wanna work, right? Have you ever heard that? You guys need to learn how to work. But you know what's interesting? I'm actually reading a book right now on Generation Z and it says almost more than any other generation, in the history of the United States of America, okay, this has been a comprehensive study, is that you guys prioritize your future career more than any, more than any other generation ever. In fact, studies are coming out where, where people are asking like, what do you prioritize and value more than anything? What do you, what do you want to accomplish before you're 30 more than anything else? What, what are your highest priorities? Studies are showing that more than anything, more than wanting to get a husband or a wife, in fact, less than, one, less than one out of five Generation Z people want to be married before the age of 30. That's wild. Way less than that want to have a kid before the age of 30. But, but like, 
crazy statistics show that more than anything, you just want to have a really good career and you make a lot of money. You want to be, you want to be ready to go. You want to, you want to be established in the world. You want to be successful. And for whatever reason, that, that's what the studies are showing. And if we had more time, we could talk about what these writers are saying. Maybe the reason is. But for a lot of you, if you thought, what are my main priorities? You're already thinking about your degree. Some of you freshmen, sophomores, I'm going to get this degree so I can get this job and it's going to be really, really great. And, and I'm not saying that this is bad. Work's great. Your future career is amazing. I think it's all great. But if it holds more of your attention and affections than anything else, maybe just maybe it's taken the place of something or someone a whole lot greater than that. Maybe the reason that we put work here is that for even students, money has a seat on the throne of your heart and your life, right? And so you're thinking about your future career because you know what? You just want to have an awesome house has some really cool stuff. And again, none of, this, none of that's necessarily bad. Some of you to get more practical right now, okay? Right now, you value money so much because you know why? You need the Adidas shoes. You need the Ultra Boosts, right? Like you need the Champion hoodie. You need the coolest name brands. And so maybe it's not money. Maybe it's just stuff. Maybe it's like the coolest car out of your friend group if you're an upperclassman. Like, and it, it's just kind of this, again, this social kind of status where you're like, yeah, man, I got my stuff together. I wear the coolest stuff. I have a lot of stuff. I have a lot of money. And, and maybe, just maybe, again, money is not necessarily a bad thing, but I will say this. I was tempted to say it. I'm going to say it. Okay. Jesus, Jesus says you can't serve both God and money. You just can't. In other words, Jesus isn't going to fight, isn't going to fight against money. He knows he's so much better than money. And it's not just this idol, it's any of them. Jesus isn't going to be like, Jesus isn't going to share a seat with anything or anyone, anyone other than him. He's not. He's going to be there and he's going to be alone. We see this in, in, in the letter to the Roman church. Romans, where, where Paul's speaking in Romans chapter 1, and he says, some of you guys, you, for, you forsook the truth for a lie, and you've stopped worshiping the Creator, and you've worshiped Creator things. And do you know what God did in response to that? He just gave them over. He said, okay, that's what you want. That's what you think you need. There you go. Next. This is a great thing. I love my family. I love your families. But a lot of times, family, and I, I, I should probably put a line through that and say friends. A lot of times your world, the students, a lot of times my world, as a 27-year-old guy, a lot of times the parents' world in the room, our lives revolve around our family and our friends. Some of you parents are like, these kids didn't revolve around the family. Maybe it's friends. But man, like your people, they, 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 they take up most of your time, most of your attention, most of your affections, and your whole world revolves around what your crew's doing, and you're Snapchatting to them, and you're talking to them, and you got to make sure that you're with them, and all these different things, and you find your meaning, and your value, and your friend group, and maybe, just maybe, if you lost it, your meaning, and your purpose, and your identity would go crashing down with it. Going along with Snapchat, texting, maybe just maybe your phone sits here. And so before in the morning, before you wake up in the morning and you're like, I'm going to worship Jesus or I'm going to pray to Jesus or I'm going to ask Jesus to help me kind of like be a light in my school or whatever that would look like, before you even give thought to God or the things of God, you do what I did this morning. You pull out the phone. And you're just obsessed with it. Like, I'm on it, I'm on it, I'm on it, I'm on it, I'm on it. I texted Abby just like a few weeks ago, and I said, I feel like I'm getting dumber. Anybody ever feel that way? I feel like I am getting literally like to the point where like, you know, my attention span, all these different things. I had this spell for a few days where I was just on my phone scrolling, looking at the same pictures all the time. I'm like, what are you doing? You know, and it's so funny. We get up in the morning, literally. We get up, a lot of you guys stay up. Uh, how many of you guys kind of stay up a little late? You guys would say you stay up a little late, okay? For a lot of us, a lot of us. And the first thing we do in the morning, we check our feed, and we're like, I wonder what happened since the last time I checked it. Nothing. Nothing did. It was, it was like the middle of the night. Nothing took place. But we just got to check it. We got to check it. We got to check it. What's, what's, what I respect about your generation, okay, is at least you guys will admit it. At least you guys will admit it. Yep, I couldn't live without my phone. I've had the conversation. We've had talks. 
absolutely. Social media, Snapchat, there's no way that I could function without that. And for a lot of us, our world just revolves around it. Studies are coming out where it's not just your generation either. I'm not ripping on you. You guys just admit it. You guys are the bravest ones. You guys can at least say it. But for a lot of us, we're, we're, we're like, for a lot of us, literally, the studies are coming out where, where, where we, can, we literally get anxiety when our phone's in another room. If it's not on our hip, if it's not in our pocket, we begin to freak out. Like, oh my gosh, where's my phone? Where's my phone? Where's my phone? Anybody ever felt that way? Anybody? I'm just saying, maybe just maybe we, we, need to, we need to chill out with the phones a little bit. But what's funny for me is I put a limit on it, okay? I put a limit on it. I think it was like 45 minutes or to an hour a day for like all of like my different social media apps. You know what I've been doing? Just ignore it. Just give me 15 more minutes, right? And for a lot of us, I think, you know, we just need to work on it. And again, I'm speaking to myself here, fam. Uh, for some of us, this is huge. It's approval. We crave it, we're obsessed with it, and we, our life revolves around making sure everyone else likes us. Or maybe not everyone, maybe just the cool kids. Maybe just the popular kids. So we could put approval or we could put popularity or we could put our boyfriend or our girlfriend or whatever crew we hang out with, but you know what? They just have to approve of us. They have to think we're cool. They have to think we're good looking. They have to think we're funny. They have to think we're, we have a good social, a lot of it comes down to social media. This is why a lot of us delete the pictures we put up because people didn't approve of it enough. They didn't get enough likes. This is why we're sending Snapchats to our friends saying, hey, go like my picture. Like and comment. And I'm not, I'm not even ripping it, but I think maybe, just maybe, I want us to challenge ourselves a little bit. Why do we do that? Maybe, just maybe, it's approval. And, and, and that's minuscule. That's small. Asking people to like a picture. For a lot of us, your biggest regrets in high school will take place because of this right here. The only reason you would ever do that is because you want someone to like you or approve of you. You want to be in the cool crowd. You want to be approved of. You want to be accepted. You want to be liked. And so you'll make decisions and you're like, why would I ever do such a thing? It doesn't make any sense. That's not me. That's not who God created me to be. I don't even really want to do that. I know it's wrong, but we crave this so much. And for a lot of us, we fall into the trap of approval. Next, for some of us, it's romance. So we send pictures, or we ask for pictures, or we date someone we know we shouldn't date. And once we start dating them, even, even though we know we shouldn't be dating them, we'll do anything we possibly can to keep them. So we send, again, we send text messages and we call and we feel really, really bad about ourselves if we don't have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, or maybe it's not necessarily a boyfriend or a girlfriend, but if people, if the opposite sex isn't interested in us, it's to the point where like, you know, again, some of our identity, some of our meaning, some of our purpose seems to go with it. For a lot of us, we become obsessed with boys and girls and we just gotta have someone who likes us, someone we could talk to, someone we could chat with, someone that we could find companionship with. Next, for a lot of us, it's pleasure. And fun is your God. Fun, pleasure, sits on the throne here. And so again, you'll probably cross some boundaries and do some things maybe you know you shouldn't do, but it's fun. You only go to middle school once, you only go to high school once, right? You got to have a good time. Maybe it's pleasure. And I think the reason all of these are here is because there's one overarching idol, when I begin to put things above Jesus in my life, generally it comes down to one overarching idol in my world, and it is this, it's self. Self. Where essentially I am king, I'm gonna do what I wanna do, it's my life, it's me, you know, I'm gonna do me, nobody's gonna tell me what to do, it's my life, right? The reason that maybe just maybe you begin to worship your friends or your family is because it's your friends or your family. The reason you begin to worship your grades or your future job or whatever it might be is because it's yours. The reason maybe you're worshiping your pleasure and your fun is because it's yours and nobody's going to take that from you. It's my time. 
It's my pleasure. I'm going to do with it what I want. And, and let me just say this. You're great. You're, you're cool. I think you guys are all awesome. You guys look good. Fun. You're engaged tonight, which is awesome. It's good. Smiled a few times. I think you guys are great. You're made in the image of God. You're, you're really cool. It's a fun group. I love being here with you guys every Sunday night. I thought about it. Pleasure? Finding joy? Scripture talks about in, how in his presence there are pleasures forevermore. Pleasure is not a bad thing as long as you find it in the right, you know, ways. Next, romance. <laughs> I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing, okay? Middle schoolers, high schoolers, like, you can maybe slow down a little bit, but companionship, okay? Like, having a good friend, okay? Thinking a boy's cute or something? I don't know. That's not necessarily a bad thing, okay? For those of us who are older in the room, the desire, maybe some of the college students, the desire to one day have a spouse and all these different things, like, I think maybe that's a God-given desire. I don't think romance is a bad or evil thing. Approval? I thought about this. At first, I was going to be like, that's really bad. But I think if people like you, I think if people think you're nice and kind and you influence them, I think you could probably leverage that for the kingdom of God more than you would if people didn't like you, if people didn't approve of you. Your phone, this has the potential to do a lot of good if you own it. If you own it and you don't let it own you, which not many of us do that, this could be a good thing. Being able to share the love of God, being able to encourage someone with a text message, being able to stay in touch with friends or whatever it is, that's not a bad thing. I would say that that's probably a good thing if it's used in the right way. Your family, that goes without saying. Your family's, your family's great, okay? Money, it's, it's not a bad thing. Money's very necessary in this world, right? Like money is not evil in and of itself. It's not. And work, we see from the very beginning in Genesis chapter one, this is a gift from God. All these things are, all these things are really good, but they make horrible gods, if you revolve your life around anything other than Jesus, you will be utterly dissatisfied. You will, be, you, will be, you will be let down every single time. The only way that these things are good is if they're right here. The only way these things are good is if they're under the kingship and the lordship of Jesus. The only way that these things are good, if we're saying, hey, how can I use work and my future goals? How can I use school? How can I use my friendships? How can I use my relationships with my family? How can I use my hobbies and my pleasures and all these different things? How can I use them to make much of Jesus? These things are good, but when they become supreme, they become really bad and really damaging and really dangerous. And some of you feel it. Some of you know it. Some of you, as we've talked about some of those things, you've, you've come to the realization, I have revolved my life around something that I was not designed to revolve my life around, and, and your life has suffered because of it. You've made decisions that you know you shouldn't have made because of that. These things are fine. These things are good. Gifts from God. But they make horrible gods. Idols always ask for more and more, while giving less and less until eventually they demand everything and give nothing. But, but what's interesting, what's interesting is that Jesus, while he demands everything, let's just say, let's just, I, I see that clearly in scripture. He says, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. He says, love me more than anything. He, he demands your heart. He demands your attention, your affections. He, he, demand, he wants you to revolve your whole world around him. He always gives more to you than you could ever give to him. More joy, more hope, more peace, more satisfaction that you could ever possibly imagine. And so how do, you, how do you get these off of this seat and keep Jesus here? How does that take place? What happens? Well, how many of you guys have studied Romeo and Juliet? Wow, a lot of you guys. Raise your hand. This is going to go so much better than the sun did on Sunday morning. That's great. How many of you guys remember Rosalind? So you guys are my people. This is great, okay? So Romeo, at the beginning of the play, okay, is like lovesick with Rosalind. He loves Rosalind, okay? And Rosalind doesn't love him back. And, and he's lovesick, and he's pining over her. And then his homie Benvolio comes up, and essentially what he says is he's like, hey, Benvolio, come to a party, and there are going to be a lot better looking chicks at this party than Rosalind, okay? Loose translation, but that's essentially what he says. And then Romeo is like, no way! 
No one's ever seen a woman like Rosalind. And then he goes to the party, and he beholds Juliet, and then he goes to her yard, and, and he says something that I forget what he said. I don't have my computer up here, but he said something in a really weird way. But essentially what he was saying is, is like, wow, Rosalind who? Like, wow, I've, I've, beho- I've beheld Juliet. Like, Juliet is extraordinary. And why I share that is, is how do you get rid of Rosalind? You, you behold Juliet. How do you dislodge a beautiful thing from the human heart? You replace it with a much more beautiful thing. This is what takes place. You take your attention off of these things, and you put your attention and your devotion and your affection, and your mind and your thoughts on something greater than all of these things things. The Apostle Paul actually writes to a church in Colossae and theologians believe that they were tempted to go back to idol worship. Do you know that he really never even addresses the idols? He doesn't really talk about the idols. What he does is he says things like this in Colossians 1, 15 through 20. Let's skip that slide for the sake of time. And he says this, the son is the image of the invisible God. Speaking of Jesus, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood that was shed on the cross. How does he do this? How does he, how does he, how does he address the monster of idolatry? How does he, he says, hey, just quit, quit, quit revolving, quit thinking about these things, okay? And, and just think about Jesus. This is what happens for the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is living a life before Christ where we see, we actually are going to read about it this week in our devotional. How many of you guys are keeping up with normal isn't working? few of us love it. That's great. Yeah, we got a couple claps. In fact, Evan Bourgeois is live at nine tonight, fam. Okay, let's get it. Okay, let's go. It's amazing. Um, But we're going to talk about it in this devotional this week. But the Apostle Paul, before he meets Jesus, his whole world revolves around himself. It's very clear. His own intellect, he talks about it in Philippians chapter three. His own, his own, you know, like memorization and all these, his experts, his, his, you know, him being an expert of the law. But then he says this in Philippians three, seven through eight. But whatever gains, whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. Look at this. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. I consider these things rubbish compared to knowing Jesus. Paul says, hey, 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 if you want to dislodge these different things from your life, if you want to stop revolving your world around Jesus, just think, or if you want to stop revolving your life around anything other than Jesus, just just think about Christ. And as you think about him, and as you spend time with him, and as you do these devotionals, and as you have conversations with your leaders, and as you live in community with one another, and as you direct your attention to Jesus, eventually you're going to be like, nothing else compares. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. I know it's going to happen. What's interesting in this book that I'm reading about Generation Z is for a lot of us, when we talk about our phones, when, when, when someone would ask you, like, hey, why are you on it so much? Like, like why, why are you so obsessed with it? Why do you get anxious when you're not around it? Why do, you, why do you say that you can't function without of it? For a lot of us, we would, for a lot of us, we would just say, what else am I going to do? Where else am I going to go? I don't know anything else. In fact, the theme of this generation's response when they're asked about their phones is they actually say, to whom shall I go? That's essentially the theme of it. To whom shall I go? And there's this interesting passage in John chapter 6, and then I'm closing, where, where Jesus gives a difficult teaching and people start to leave. People start to say, I'm not going to revolve my life around you anymore. And then he looks at his apostles and he says, are you guys going to leave too? 
Are you going to leave too? And then Peter says this, Lord, to whom shall we go? Sound familiar? To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you're the Holy One of God. Peter says, I, we've walked with you. We've beheld you. We've seen your majesty and your grace and your kindness and your miracles. We have beheld the real, the living Jesus, the Savior of the world. Why would we give our life to anyone or anything else? Father, we love you and we're grateful for you and how good you are. And uh, Father, I pray that for some of us tonight, we can maybe think about the life that you call us to in a different light. You don't just demand us, you don't, God. You, you don't just com to command us to come to the edge on Sunday nights, sing a couple songs, and then go about our lives and have a good week at school and do all these different things and not really think about you until the next Sunday night at six if we're lucky enough to get there. No. You demand that we revolve our whole world around you when it comes to the way that we treat people at school, when it comes to our friendships, when it comes to our social media, when it comes to our Snapchats, when it comes to the way that we honor our parents, when it comes to the way that we honor our teachers, when it comes to the way that we study, when it comes to the way that we do all of life, we are to revolve it all around you. Our whole world is to be centered on the love of of God, which is greater than anything or anyone else in our world. It doesn't mean that we devalue any of these things. It doesn't mean that we diminish any of these things. In fact, most of, t most of the times we enjoy these things much greater when we keep Jesus at the center of our lives. And so God, I pray that we can do that as middle schoolers. It's hard, it's difficult. We're, we're never gonna get it. We're never gonna get it right all the time. As high schoolers, there are going to be times where things sneak into our lives. But Father, I pray that more than anything, even during this song, that we would think about you, that we would behold you, that we would do what Paul says over and over and over again in his letters. May we fix our thoughts on things above, not on earthly things. May we think about your kindness and your grace and your perfection, and may that form the way that we live our whole entire life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand up and let's sing this song.